Hey, you guys look good today. Welcome to Vox Church. Is anybody else excited to be here? I am. If you're new to Vox, we're so glad you're here. My name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor. Thank you for being a part of our church. If you were with us last week, we heard from uh, Pastor Tim Lucas. He gave an amazing word. Was anybody encouraged by Tim's message? So good. Brandon Cormier, the week before that, just awesome stuff. We reserve the end of our year, every single year, for uh, vision here at Vox. Where are we going? Where are we headed? What's next? It's a very special time, and that begins today with this series that we're calling Open Doors. And so it's an exciting time. If you're kind of new, you'll get a little glimpse of kind of where the church is headed over the next number of weeks. And we conclude every year with what we call our expansion offering, where we invite those in our church to sacrifice so that we can reach more people, plant more churches, and expand the gospel across New England. So that will be on December 10th, which is a special day here at the Vox family. But let me say something that's very important. If you're new to Vox, and I know a lot of you are, a lot of you, maybe it's your first time, or maybe it's your second time, or maybe it's your third time, and you're kind of just checking us out. Number one, we're really glad you're here during this time of year, because it does allow you to learn a little bit more about us, learn about the vision of Vox and the future of Vox. So that's awesome that you're here. The expansion offering on December 10th is not something that we're asking you to participate in, okay? You won't hear too many preachers say that, all right? And so you're off the hook. Congratulations, all right? And so if you're new and you're kind of checking us out, here's what we want you to do. Take this time to ask the Lord, Lord, is this the church you've called me to commit to? Is this the place you've called me to put down roots? And hopefully during this vision series, that will get clear, okay? But for all of those who call Vox Church home, this is your family of faith. This is your community of faith. We do invite you to participate and begin to pray. Begin to ask the Lord, Lord, how would you have me sacrifice at the end of the year so that we can expand the reach of the gospel on December 10th and beyond? And so begin to ask the Lord about that if this is your family of faith. And we gave you these little booklets. We do this every year just to give you a picture of uh, where we're headed. It gives you some practicals, gives you some financials. And so we'll dive into that over the next number of weeks. And so as I said, the theme that's been on my heart for probably the last three or four months is this theme of open doors, open doors. And I want to start today in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church in Corinth. He says this in verse 5. He says, I'll visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, or perhaps I'll stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you just now in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, check this out, for a wide door of effective work has opened to me And there are many adversaries for a wide door of effective work has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. I want to begin this series, this end of year open door series under the heading recognizing opportunity, recognizing opportunity. Let's pray, church. Open our hearts to God. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity, this one right here, right now where we can enter the presence of Jesus, come around your word, hear the voice of your spirit be changed. We invite you to change us. Lord, we want to become more like Christ. I sense the Spirit of God here right now. I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive. We open up to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In 1928, people were dying of paper cuts. I know that may sound a little ridiculous to us today, but during this time in human history, pre-1928, when you got an infection from a cut, it was often incurable because there were no antibiotics. Uh, many times women in childbirth would, would develop an infection and die. Many times children would get a cut or a bruise or some type of infection in their body, in their leg or their arm, and it would spread and the infection would prove to be fatal. But in September of 1928, Dr. Alexander Fleming came home from vacation and found that a number of his test samples that he had left out while he was away had developed mold. And as he looked to his surprise, what he discovered is that the mold was actually stopping the bacteria from spreading. And so he published his findings about this mold power, this bacteria-killing mold, calling it penicillin. And as others began to explore these discoveries, this one thing found by Dr. Fleming changed the world. 
Interesting little fact that the first person who was successfully treated for, with penicillin for an infection was Ann Miller in the city of New Haven, Connecticut, of all the places. But today, all across the United States, over 200,000 people a year are saved because of penicillin just in America alone, even hundreds of hundreds of thousands more all over the world. I bet that most of us probably took some antibiotics in the last 18 months. If you looked at your life, you probably had a Z-pack and knocked out that sinus infection or whatever it is. And so very often today, we take this for granted but for years and years and years, everyone just saw mold, where Dr. Fleming, he saw an opportunity. He saw an opportunity. So what do you see? What do you see when you look at this world we live in, this wild, crazy, messed up, broken world? When you look at the wars, when you look at the challenges, when you look at the offenses and, the, and, the, and all the issues of our society today, what do you see? Do you see mold or do you see opportunity? Do you see miracles or do you see limitations? What do you see when you look at the church? When you look at the people of God, the family of faith, do you see mold or do you see opportunities? What do you see when you look at your own life, when you look at your family, when you look at your neighborhood? What do you see, friend? My prayer is that today the Spirit of God would come upon you as you sit there right now and that by His Spirit He would begin to illuminate your eyes that you might see something that you haven't seen before in Jesus' name. You remember Harry Potter? You're like, don't talk about Harry Potter. You remember Harry Potter when he was told to go to platform nine and three quarters? Some of you don't know. It's all right. He goes told to go to platform nine and three quarters and he gets there and there's platform nine and there's platform 10 and he's going nine and three quarters? There's no nine and three quarters. But then he learns that platform nine and three quarters requires that you walk through a wall. It looks like a wall, but it was actually a door. See, many times in life, things that look like walls are actually doors. Things that look like mold are actually miracles. And so you need eyes to see see and then seize the opportunity. So there are really two parts to any opportunity. First is what. You have to see what it is. But then is when. You have to seize it when the door opens. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. He said the opportunity of a lifetime needs to be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. See, it's not enough to know what to do. It's about when the door swings open. Because doors open and doors close. Years ago, I read a book uh, by Dr. John Maxwell. He describes what he calls the law of timing. The law of timing says, you can put my little chart up there, that, that if you do the wrong thing at the wrong time, it is just a disaster, right? That's, that's the upper left, right? Wrong action, wrong time, no good. If you do the wrong action at the right time, well, it's just a mistake. It's a little different, but it still doesn't really uh, make a difference. If you do the right thing, at the wrong time, you'll get resistance. That's true in so many areas of life. But if you do the right action at the right time, that's where incredible success is found, where doors swing open. Now, this is true in business. This is true in the marketplace. This is actually true in relationships. It's in true in your career. But in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul is not talking about the market. He's not talking about stocks. He's not talking about your career. He's talking about something else. He's not talking about your personal investment portfolio. He's talking about an eternal investment portfolio. Paul is talking about a supernatural opportunity, a God-given door that has opened up that allows him, in this instance, to impact eternity. Now think about that for a second. You are a human being with flesh and blood. You got problems and electric bills and you got a sore on your left foot and you got school to finish up next week and you got all these different things going on in your life, but you're not just a physical being. You are also, according to the scripture, a spiritual being. And at the same time that you are physically living in this world, every decision you make, every thought you think, every action you take is either driving you closer to heaven or further from it. And so you as a spiritual being have all types of implications with every single choice. And that means that the things you do impact eternity. Think about that. Has that changed the way you live? Has it reframed the world and how you see it. And so this imagery of an open door that Paul uses here, it's not actually just found in Paul's writings. That if you start following the trail, 
you'll discover that the open door concept actually goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible where God describes creation. And we're told that the man and the woman sin against God and that because of sin, God closes the door of union with himself, that he is a holy God and our sin separates us. That sin is a willing uh, a disobedience to the commands of God. It separates us from God. And this is represented through the Garden of Eden, the place of union and relationship with God that is closed off. Look at it in Genesis 3. It says, so the Lord God banished him, that's Adam, from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side, everybody say east side, east side, that's important, the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim, that's an angel with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life, the tree of life representing union with your creator, but now it is barred off on the eastern gate with an angel. Sin shut the door between union with God and God and man. And so this led to a universal cry, a cry that every person experiences on the inside. Some of us are aware of it. Some of us are ignorant to it, but it exists in you. A cry that every person, every community, every people group throughout all of history has uh, brought up to heaven. And it's this universal cry to be right with God. Psalm 118 describes it like this. The psalmist writes, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. See, your heart longs to be right with God. That's what righteousness means, right standing with God. Your heart longs to be right with God and yet there always seems to be a distance. You know he's there. Psychologists call it intuitive theism. Something inside the human psyche is aware of the fact that the creator is in fact present and yet he is at the same time distant, and we want to be close. And this is why the Old Testament prophets all through the Bible foretell of a day where God will in himself bring back together God and man, where he will bridge the divide, where God will lead the way back to himself. And so Micah, the prophet, in Micah chapter 2, tells us that a Messiah will come, and here's what the Savior or the Messiah will do. It says, the one, look at this, who breaks open the way, same language here, who breaks open the way will go up before them. So God is going to somehow break open a way back to himself, and he's going to do it in front of you. They, that's those who follow him, will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass before them, the Lord at their head. And so God is going to manifest himself as a king on the earth. And he is going to make a way for people to be right with himself. Now for 400 years, the prophets were silent and nothing changed in history. And then Jesus of Nazareth was baptized in the Jordan River. And look at the language used by the writer Matthew in Matthew chapter 3. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. But what happened? At that moment, check this out, heaven was what? It was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. That is a symbol. That is a sign that goes all the way back to Genesis that God was opening the door between heaven and earth through the ministry of Christ. Christ who lived as a perfect man, your representative before God, and then Christ who chose willingly to die as a substitute for the sins of the world. And so, look at the imagery here. When God allowed his son to be crucified and the hands of Jesus were stretched out and nails were put through his hands, and he was nailed to a cross while Romans were nailing Christ to a cross. God at the same time was nailing open the door of heaven so that through the sacrifice of Christ, you might have access to God forever, friends. This is what the Bible calls good news. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't punch a card to get it. It was freely given through the sacrifice of his son by an act of love. That's why Hebrews chapter 10 says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus, here's that same language, opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. All of this imagery of the open door culminates in the book of Revelation. The very last book in the Bible where the Apostle John sees the end of the age, the return of Christ, and the establishment of his kingdom. And here's what he says in Revelation chapter 4. He says, And then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. I wonder if you see it. I wonder if your whole life has been reoriented in accordance with that door. Friends, you remember that the angels stood 
let's go a little deeper, on the eastern gate of the Garden of Eden. Don't you know that when Jesus entered the city on a donkey, that we read that he entered through the eastern gate into Jerusalem? That just as the angel barred the way back to union with God, so Christ came as king and reopened the door back to the presence of God through his death on the cross. That just as God made the sun to rise in the east as a symbol of his resurrected son who would rise from the dead, that by the sun I see everything, so now by Christ I can see beyond myself into eternal life and experience the very presence of God right now. Oh, I pray he'd give you sight. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened by the spirit of the living God. See, this is what it means to follow Christ. The Apostle Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, check this out. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. That is a weird verse, right? Hey, I want you to look at the unseen. What? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Why? Because what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Maybe this is the great disease of the Christian church. Maybe we have been so consumed with the seen that we have missed the unseen, that we have missed the eternal things that God invites us to participate in. And so following Christ requires that we reorient around the unseen. You know, you can't see a human soul, but every time a person opens their life to Christ, turns to Jesus, trusts in him, receives forgiveness of sins, repents and believes in the good news of God's grace, it tells us in the scripture that all of heaven rejoices and erupts in applause and praise and celebration. So what could happen if you and I got our eyes off of the scene and began to see the unseen? Twelve years ago, we started Vox Church with, with nine people and a dream, all right? Nine people in a dream. I want to share that dream, and maybe some of you have heard this a lot of times. That's okay, you get to hear it again. Or maybe some of you never heard it because you're new and you're just checking things out. We said that the dream of this church from the very beginning, 12 years ago, was to see New England changed from the least church region to the most spiritually vibrant place on earth. Now, you may have never kind of thought about this, and that's fine, but, but New England, uh, fewer people read the Bible, follow Jesus, attend church than anywhere else in the United States, okay? It is the greatest mission field in America, the northeast corner of the country. And so this dream got deep inside of us. There's 14 million people in New England, and we said this is the most unreached people group. We believe in one generation that we're going to see this region changed from the least church to the most spiritually vibrant. And so that's been the cry of this church. And, uh, and we started, you know, in one location in uh, the city of New Haven, and we began to focus on population centers. Just a little over a year after we launched the church, we started a second church in Bridgeport, which was crazy. We had no business doing it. And then we, and then we launched in Middletown, and then we launched in Hartford, and then on and on and on and on. And today... We have 11 churches, okay? 11 churches that are part of this Vox Church movement. Six of them are in one of the 10 largest New England cities, okay? And so each of these churches we've strategically launched believing that we're going to reach that town, reach that community. We're going to be at the Christmas tree lighting. We're going to be sharing the love of Christ. We're going to be serving the community. We're going to be an outreach post to the people of that region to love them well and to share the good news of God's grace. And so 12 years in 11 churches, but in 2021, in 22, we began to think a little differently about starting churches in New England. And we said, hey, wait a minute. If we launch from the center a new church, it's very slow. But if we begin to launch from the edges, things can start to multiply. Now, we call this our campus to campus uh, strategy. Let me try to stay with you and just, just kind of walk this through with me, okay? Now, if, if we just launch one church out of the whole church every year, then we could maybe do, I don't know, 20 churches, 30 churches in a lifetime. But we said, what if every Vox church prepared to start a Vox church every four years? Okay, what if we could build an infrastructure in place in preparation that every church could be ready to start a church every four years? That means that if we have 11 now in four years, we'd have 22 outposts sharing the gospel all across New England. And then four years from there, we'd have 44. And then four years from there, we'd have 88. And then four years from there, we'd have 176. And the dream of our heart was said, in one generation, could we see 400 churches planted across New England to reach people with the gospel? Now, if we did, and their average size was 350 people. That means that on a weekly basis, we'd be reaching 140,000 people, which is exactly 1% of New England's population. And so you might hear that and go, well, that's stupid. Nobody could do that. 
And I just concede the point. You're right. That is stupid and nobody can do it. We can't do that. We can't do that. There's no way that we could possibly do that. But over the last 12 years, friends, I've seen something. I've seen something. I've seen something that I've never seen before. I grew up in this area. I've seen an open door. I've seen an open door. On October 8th, many of you know, we, we planted two churches on the same day. Never did that before, but we, we started a church in New Britain, and we started a church in Clinton, Connecticut, on the same day. New Britain, by the way, gets us closer to Waterbury, to launching Waterbury, which is the 10th largest New England city. And, and Clinton gets us closer to launching Providence, which is the 5th largest New England city. And so we're, we're looking at population centers. How do we actually reach this whole region? We're going to Boston in Jesus' name. So how do we actually reach this whole region with the gospel? And so we're strategically looking at it. And here's what I'm saying. We've seen this open door. They're only eight weeks old. They're only eight weeks old. I remember the first gathering of Clinton. I wasn't there. I was preaching here live. We were streaming to Clinton. And, 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 and I said to my father-in-law, it was a long story, but I was sitting with him on Saturday night right before the first service of our Clinton location. I looked at him. I said, Bob, there could be 300 people there tomorrow. And we laughed about it. And then 306 people showed up the next day at a brand new church in a little town called Clinton. Clinton, Connecticut just went to two services. Right now, both New Britain and Clinton have not gone under 200 people for a single service. They are currently over three times the size of the average American church, and they're eight weeks old in the least church region of the United States. There's a door. There's a door that's just swung open. It's swung open. You know that this year alone, 403 people have actually filled out a card at Vox that said, I gave my life to Jesus. I want to follow him. Now, 403 only only actually represents a fraction of those that have made a decision for Christ this year because you know and I know that most New Englanders you say hey I'll give Jesus my soul but I'm not giving you my number right so I'm not gonna fill out a card but I'll still open my life to Christ we're a little skeptical of ever filling out cards which I get it that's fine but but my point is that of all those that said yes to Christ we already had over 400 who actually filled out a card at the same time over 3,300 people just this year have filled out a card that said it's my first time at church. And so what are we seeing? We're seeing this hunger. We're seeing this spiritual hunger spread. And so I believe with all my heart that it's time to stop asking why and start asking why not? Why not here? Why not now? Why not? Last year, we end every year, in our 12 years, every single year at Vox we've done this, we end with an expansion offering, like I mentioned on December 10th. This expansion offering is really what we, the funds that we use to start new churches, expand, move forward, get new facilities, et cetera. Last year, I talked about this, and if you were here, you remember, we said we're going to plant two new churches, and we said we're going to renovate and open a permanent location in Springfield, Massachusetts. Springfield is the fourth largest New England city. A downtown area opened up for us to be able to launch a church, right? A diagonal from the brand new massive casino in downtown Springfield and diagonal from the Basketball Hall of Fame. And so you got it all right in downtown. Now you got Vox there too. And so we, uh, we, we secured this facility. We renovated this facility. And with your help, with all the sacrifices and the steps of faith that people took last year, we opened Clinton, we opened New Britain, and we renovated and opened a new space in Springfield. And so some of you haven't been there. Yeah, praise the Lord, right? That's crazy. Some of you have never been to Springfield, so I thought it would be appropriate to bring Springfield to you. And so we made a little video, gives you a glimpse of this new space. Let's take a look. We are on Main Street, downtown Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm here with Pastor Corey and Box Church. We just wanted to take you through the new Springfield facility. Are you ready to come inside? Come on in. All right, here we go. This is the our lobby. When you come in, we have most of a coffee. We have music playing, of course, but this is where the party happens. When you come in, we're cheering people on, we're loving people, getting ready for service. Church, take a look at this. Main Street, downtown, windows, in the entire front of the building, just welcoming people into the place of worship. It's awesome. Come on. <laughs> as a back view, as you come into the auditorium of sanctuary, what you see is we have 200 seats here, and people are experiencing the presence of Jesus here. This space here, it can fit outfit to about 240 seats, but right now, 200 seats is what we have. And on a Sunday, you'll see us worshiping, 
like going out to the Lord. Um, I love the worship culture here at Springfield. People are really uh, passionate about Jesus here. So on a normal Sunday when you walk in, you just see this place really on fire for Jesus. And I love that about this space. Church, this auditorium was an old restaurant, an old bar, and we completely outfitted it. Everything you see is new. The guys did an incredible job. New sound, new walls, new paint, and now uh, all of it really to create an environment where people can experience Jesus, where we can encounter the love of Christ week in, week out, day in, day out. Constantly ministry happening here in downtown Springfield. Right here as you come up the stairs, you see Ruth, this space upstairs is a multi-purpose space. So we transform this space on Sunday mornings into our roots. But throughout the week, what you will see, it can be a space for a prayer, a space for a meeting, a workspace. Again, multi-purpose space, but on Sunday morning, you come in, you have uh, Ruth's kids here. But it's a great space. The brick is exposed, totally transformed, new paint, new lights. So here it is, multi-purpose space, conference room, children's space on Sundays. Box Church, we just want to say thank you. This space has been transformed over the last number of months because of your generosity, your willingness to invest in the vision and expand the reach of the gospel in the city of Springfield, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thanks for believing in this call and the hundreds of people who are gonna experience Jesus right here in this space because of your sacrifice. We're so grateful and I really believe the best is yet to come in this city and in every city all across New England. God bless. On. I mean, that's a little fun, right? You thought church was boring. No, it's incredible. Listen, you know, right now, every month, we have a number of different universities who are using our Springfield space to gather as worshipers of Jesus. So college campuses are coming together month after month using our space to do it. Right now, we're looking into AA gatherings in that space. Right now, we're using that space as a hub to get school supplies to kids all across downtown and inner city Springfield. On and on and on, the opportunities open up. Look at what Paul says in verse 8. He says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. Look at that person next to you and just tell them, stay in Ephesus. Go ahead, tell them, stay in Ephesus. You got to stay in Ephesus. For, why? A wide door of effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, if you know a little bit about Paul, you know that Paul was not from Ephesus. Paul was from Tarsus, okay? And so Ephesus and Tarsus are not super close to one another, and so in Ephesus, he was far from home. He was far from his family. It was a different language, a different culture, a different people, and notice in this text that he doesn't go, well, I'm going to stay in Ephesus because the weather's really nice. I'm going to stay in Ephesus because my tech company just moved their base of operations there. He says, no, 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 something else is driving me to stay at Ephesus. What is it? It's a wide door. It's a supernatural opportunity. So I want to just express a few things that we have to understand if we're ever going to see and seize eternal opportunities. And the first thing that we have to be willing to do is adjust our plans, adjust our plans. Now, which of us here today like adjusting? No, not so much. Our plans, right? We don't like that. It's like, well, I have a plan and I'm doing my plan and that's kind of my thing and I'm just sort of asking God to bless my plan, you know? And so, hey, this is why I live in this town. This is why I go to this place. This is why I have my career going this way. And when opportunities in my career open up, that's what I'm going to do. And friends, it's not wrong to take a, a, a part of, of, a, of an opportunity that opens in your career, whatever. But, but Paul wasn't just simply driven by the random physical opportunities. He also experienced the truth of God in such a way that it forced him to think through spiritual opportunities, right? A number of years ago when Christy and I first were praying about planting this church, we both grew up in this area and we both believed God for great growth in the church as we were teenagers. And we both saw the local church of New England stall out, not reaching people, not baptizing people, not expanding. And so in 2009, 2010, as the Holy Spirit started to stir in our hearts to plant this church, uh, Chrissy's whole family, just to be candid, moved to Florida. And, and as they had moved to Florida, we were thinking, um, it's a lot warmer down there. People are a lot nicer down there. They have palm trees. Their beaches don't have syringes. You know, it was like, it was like, it was like <laughs> come on, New England, right? And it was, like, it was like, maybe we should go there. And we just, every time we prayed, we felt the Holy Spirit say, stay, stay, stay. God, stay where it's cold. 
Yeah. Stay where it's expensive. Yeah. Stay where people are grumpy. Yeah. Stay where people drive crazy. Yeah. Stay, stay, stay. Yes. Stop seeing mold and start believing for miracles. God has a plan for this place and he put you here for such a time as this. And so we said, yes, friends, I don't know the story of your life, but are you willing to stay in Ephesus? Are you willing to stay if God says stay? Are you willing to go if God says go? Who holds the keys to the decisions of your life? Are they just made in the natural realm? Or have you begun to say, God, all that I have is yours. What do you have for me? See, a lot of times we like the idea of learning that God is our father. And he is, by the way, for all those who trust in Christ, he is your father. It's a very important revelation to take hold of, but he's not just your father. According to the scripture, God must also be your master. And that one's not nearly as popular as father because master means that he gets to make the final call in your life, that he gets to have the final say that if he sends you somewhere or calls you to stay, that in the end, it will be better for you and more glorious for him. And so you have to trust him and be willing to say yes. See, so many of us, our maturity in Christ stalls out because we're not willing to adjust our plans. Philippians 3 gives us Paul's perspective. He says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. What's Paul saying? He's saying, compared to Jesus... <laughs> I'll give up the palm trees. Compared to Jesus, I'll change anything in my life because he's that valuable to me. Something bigger has come into my view and that something has changed everything. And some of us, you're here today and your life lacks purpose and your heart feels empty and you're not sure why and it's because you've been trying to build your own adventure rather than engaging God's adventure for your life. See, here's what I know. If following Jesus hasn't messed up your plan yet, you probably aren't following Jesus because he always causes us to adjust our plans according to his will and his purpose. So are you willing? Are you surrendered? Because for some of us, the Lord is going to call you out and we bless you, we love you, we're always your family. But for others, for many others, God is gonna call you to stay in Ephesus and you're going to say opportunities are better elsewhere, but I'm called to be a part of this mission to see New England change. And so I'm going to rearrange my life for the glory and the purpose of God on the earth. You know, uh, just this past week, Chrissy and I were with two of our kids and um, we were going to watch a TV show. And we couldn't find anything to watch. You ever been there? It's like, you know, I just can't, I can't find anything, can't find anything. And, uh, and so finally, it's a little embarrassing, we ended up watching the Brady Bunch, all right? So you remember the Brady Bunch? Yeah. Like, I didn't even see the Brady Bunch, but it's like an old school show. And we, we literally watched Brady Bunch episode one. My kids were like, you know, but it was, you know, there's a story, you know, and, all, and, so, and so if you ever saw Brady Bunch episode one, it's when, when Mr. Brady and soon-to-be Mrs. Brady get married. It's Mike and Carol getting married. That's the first episode. And so he has three sons. She has three daughters. He has a dog. She has a cat. They all come together for the marriage ceremony. And it's amazing until the dog starts to chase the cat and then the kids start to chase the dog and then the parents start to chase the kids in the midst of the marriage ceremony and the cake gets knocked over and the plates get broken and everything goes crazy and it's all chaotic and Carol and Mike are furious and they're frustrated until they realize, hey, I got three kids, you got three kids, I got a dog, we, you got a cat. If we're gonna bring all this together, it's gonna be messy. Friends, what I need to tell you is if you're gonna join God's family, he's gonna adjust your plans along the way because he's got purposes you can't see. He's got kids you don't yet know and it's going to be messy. And if the Brady Bunch is crazy, the people of God are gonna be a whole lot crazier. And so buckle up for some adjustments along the way. Adjust your plans. He says, I'm going to stay in Ephesus. Why? Because some effective work has opened up. Effective work. I love that. He says effective work. And so if we want to see and seize eternal opportunities, first, you got to be willing to adjust your plans. Second, you have to be passionate about maximizing effectiveness. Maximizing effectiveness. You know, if there's one thing that I am passionate about as a pastor, it's maximizing the effectiveness of discipleship, of the mission of Jesus. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about where we're headed, church plants, construction projects, outreach opportunities, missions opportunities. And as we talk about those things, you're going to see that we're, we're always trying to dial in 
We're going to be talking about what we call discipleship first. It's going to be the major theme for 2024 as we look into the next few months. What does it really mean to grow as disciples of Christ and how can we become more effective? And the whole goal is not a big church. The whole goal is not a, not a popular church. The whole goal is an effective church, a church that actually leads people to Christ and makes disciples. You guys can bring out my whiteboard if you can. I want to try to illustrate this for you. Come on, give these guys the hand as they come out. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys. So just a little picture for you, okay? I believe that right now, uh, really, there are three different types of churches that seem to be uh, on the planet right now, especially in the West. And so um, I just want to describe the church for you with a picture. Hopefully, this is helpful to you. And maybe you grew up in church. Maybe Vox is your first church experience. Whatever the case may be, I think this will make sense. And so, uh, so... some churches we would call, they're really focused on the Bible, you would call these uh, maybe doctrinal churches. You're impressed by my circle, I know. Uh, thank you. In middle school, I was most artistic. And so that's, yeah, so that was just, just freehand. I just did that, yeah. So, and so doctrinal churches, you know, we all have our gifts, right? I can make circles, whatever. And so, um, so what is a doctrinal church, a church that's driven by sound doctrine? This means a church has good theology. This means a church is rooted in scripture. This means a church is passionate about avoiding heresy, right? Those are all very good qualities. But there's some weaknesses to the doctrinal church. If you ever went to a real like, like, you know, something Bible church, like a church that's like, oh, we study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible. That's awesome. A lot of times those churches uh, don't see too many people meet Jesus, right? Because it's, they just don't have a culture of evangelism. And so a lot of times they're, they're, they're not really connecting with the lost. And a lot of times also these very driven doctrinal churches, they don't seem to ro- leave room for the Holy Spirit, right? And so many times it's like, well, where's the move of God? And so there's another type of church that, that seems to be making waves across uh, the world. And that's what we'll call the attractional church, all right? The attractional church is the church that, you know, some have called it seeker sensitive, right? It's a church that is relevant to culture. It's a church that presents things in a more relevant way package. It's a church that's passionate about evangelism, about serving the community. That's an attractional church, okay? An attractional church is oftentimes really good at scaling, really good at structures and systems, right? And so you maybe have heard of or gone to an attractional church. You go, wow, these guys are so tight. They always, they follow a real clear system. They really hit things and and that's good, but there's some weaknesses to the attractional church too, right? Sometimes they're very weak in theology because these doctrinal guys, they got like Bible studies for Bible studies. These attractional guys, it's like, ah, well, just, uh, you know, Jesus loves me this, I know. And you don't get a whole lot of deep theology sometimes in attractional churches. Also, an attractional church can become more about the personality of the preacher than it can be about the person of Jesus. And that is a dangerous thing for an attractional church. And so that's not healthy, okay? And so attractional churches, doctrinal churches, but then you've got this third movement that's all across the globe, and we would call this the charismatic church, all right? The charismatic church is the church that believes for the work of of the Spirit. Now you might notice that this one focuses on God as Father. This one focuses on God as Son. This one focuses on the ghost, right? And so the charismatic church is all about signs and wonders. The charismatic church is all about miracles. The charismatic church is all about uh, the supernatural, the work of the Spirit, worship. And so if you need a miracle, you know, which guy do you call? You call this guy, right? Because this guy's going to pray in faith for that miracle, right? And so we see these different movements going on, but there's some weaknesses in the, in the charismatic church too. If you've ever been to a, a, a highly focused, highly charismatic church, you'll find that oftentimes they have very weak systems that you don't even know who's going to call you, when they're going to call you, when they're going to show up. You might find that they often lack real Bible knowledge, real doctrinal soundness. Many times they wander into heresy. And sometimes charismatic churches are just weird. Come on, somebody, right? It's like, let's run through the fire tunnel? What are we doing right now, right? Like, what, what, like wait, what? What are we, what, you put a cloth on me? What are we, did you, you know, like, he did what? So, you know, and so, so they can be a little strange where it's like, I don't even know what's going on. Here's what I want to do right now. I want to prophesize. You start to understand how God is working on the earth. I believe that right now God is doing something unique. And if you want to understand Vox, if you want to understand why it seems that things are spreading and growing, the doors keep opening, I believe that so much of it is because that we have been committed to be a doctrinal, attractional, charismatic church to actually live right 
here, to live within the tension of these realities, to say we want to be doctrinally sound, relevant to culture, led by the Spirit, committed to God's Word, orthodox in our convictions, open to the seeker, loving to the lost, uh, concerned about communities and the poor, but also believing for miracles, healing the sick, watching the supernatural. This dynamic is possible, and that's what leads to explosive growth. And so you might be here and you say, well, I don't really understand Vox. Well, now you do. This is who we are. This is what we're passionate about, all right? It's what drives us. It's what compels us. It's what leads us. This intersection between the doctrinal, attractional, and the charismatic, watching God work miracles as these streams come together. Verse 9, for a wide door of effective work has opened to me. There are many adversaries. He's passionate about effective work. That's why I talk about this, because it leads to effectiveness. But then Paul says something that we really don't expect. He ends the verse by going, but there are many adversaries. And it's like, wait a minute. Immature Christians often think that that if God's going to open a door, it means everything's going to be perfect in my life, right? Why isn't everything perfect in my life, right? If God was in it, wouldn't all be perfect? Friends, just because the door is open doesn't mean it's God, right? Okay? So it's like, okay, yeah, she wants to sleep with me. Okay, that may not be an open door from God, all right? You know, it's like, hey, he just left the money on the counter. I can just take it. The Lord's blessing me. No, no, the Lord's not blessing you. That's called stealing, right? And so just because the door is open doesn't mean it's open from God. In fact, a lot of times when God opens a door, it comes with challenge, struggle, and adversity, That if you want to seize the opportunities from heaven, you have to adjust your plans. Paul did that. He stayed in Ephesus. You have to maximize your effectiveness. He saw an effective door that had opened. And then thirdly, you have to anticipate adversity. You have to anticipate adversity. Here's what I'm telling you. This is not going to be easy. Okay? We're 12 years in to starting this church, this movement of churches. And it has not been easy. There have been external adversaries, okay? Culture wars, political wars, social wars, physical wars that have tried to divide the church. There have been spiritual adversity, spiritual adversity, demons, spiritual forces, things that we can't see that have tried to divide the church. Oftentimes, let's just be real, relationships are the hardest part of church, the most difficult part, because somebody hurt you, somebody lied to you, somebody let you down. You asked for the pastor to come, and he never came. You asked for this, and he never came. You couldn't get a meeting. You didn't do this. You went to a community group. They didn't care about you. They never called you. On and on and on and on. You may have some legitimate, genuine disappointment. And sometimes we misunderstand church, right? Like you go to church, and I was talking to somebody a while ago, and they were like, well, I came to your church, and, and, and so many of the people were just more screwed up than me. And I was, like, I was like, well, first of all, you're not aware of your own mess, but second of all, um, what did you expect? This isn't a, a country club for the, for the perfect. This is a hospital for the broken, right? So if the Brady Bunch is messy, <laughs> it's going to be messy. This community called the church is flawed, which means that we're going to have to take some hits. You are going to be disappointed and let down. Someone's going to betray you. And I don't want that. I'm not justifying that. I just know that when you get people in a room, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so we have to decide, am I going to be committed to a flawed church or am I going to wait around for some perfect community that does everything right because that community does not exist? But I think one of the greatest challenges, and let's just be very, very real here, is the erosion of trust that has occurred between Christians and church leaders in our time. If you've been paying attention, that trust is on life support. There have been endless financial scandals, sexual scandals, unethical use of power. And it is very easy to hear about these pastors and these leaders who did this and who did that and just disengage and always assume the worst, especially about a big church. You think, oh, my goodness, they have to be doing this, they have to be doing that, and assume the worst, you know. Um, I can say this, that, that as I watch pastors self-destruct, cheat on their wives, do this and that, I feel a profound sense of grief every time this happens. Every time, I mean, just the, the, the sorrow that I feel for the bride of Jesus, how, how discredited the church becomes because of one person's failures. 
And, and, you know, listen, I know that you might be new to the church and you don't know me yet. And you're kind of checking this whole thing out. And you're like, man, does he drive a Maserati? You know, like, what's going on? I drive a Volkswagen Golf, just so you know. All right. You know, were her, are his shoes worth a million dollars? No, they're worth about 40 bucks. Okay. All right. Because we're not about that. All right. We're not about that. And so you have questions and I get it. How do you, how do we fix this? I think we fix it with openness and with time. Okay? In other words, the leaders have to be open, you have to be open, and then it takes time. And some of you have been around for a long time, and you've already begun to establish trust for this community because of that time. But if you're new, it's going to take time. And what you're going to find is not perfect leaders, but you will find wholehearted leaders. You will find devoted leaders. You will find people who are committed to the gospel. Friends, I've been preaching this same gospel, I did the math, for 23 years, okay? Not 23 days or 23 minutes, 23 years. You can go back into the archives on our podcast, and you can literally listen to every single sermon that Vox Church has ever preached. You can go back and see what were we talking about 10 years ago. Friends, we were talking about New England being changed from the least church region to the most spiritually vibrant place on earth. We haven't changed much over the years, but it takes time. And that's why we have audited financials that we post on our website year after year. That's why we have layers of accountability. Our board of directors, we had Tim here last week who sits on that board, who gives accountability to me, sets my salary, has the power to fire me. That's why we have local and central elders and on and on. And if you want to learn more about that, go to an essentials class where we talk about it. That's why we have sexual accountability and purity within our leaders, why we're committed to biblical orthodoxy and on and on and on. You're not going to find perfect people, but you're going to find devoted people. We are not trying to get rich. We are not trying to get famous. We are not trying to make it about us. We're trying to make it about him. And we are in this, friend, for the gospel, for the poor, for the city, for awakening, for each other. And I know that takes time, and I'm not asking you to trust everything in a minute. Some of us have been around a long time, and your trust issues are more about you, right? Let's be real. But some of us, you're new here, and you're still kind of scoping us out, and that's fine. But don't stay there forever. Eventually, we got to take steps of faith and begin to, begin to trust, begin to trust. And in this environment, it will take time and it will take openness. But I want to suggest to you today that the biggest challenge facing the advancement of the gospel through the church is not external things like wars and politics. It's not spiritual things like demons and devils. And it's not even the relational challenges that we so often face. I think that the biggest thing that keeps us from running through the open door It goes deeper. It's issues in us. It's the love of self, the love of comfort, and the love of control. Those are the biggest adversaries. The love of self, the love of comfort, and the love of control. Because what happens to us, let's just be real, is you come to Christ, you experience his grace and his love, You're won over by his kindness. You join the church. And then over time, it's so easy to stop caring about the people all around you who are on their way to judgment and death. Stop caring about the people at work and the people in your family and the people in your neighborhood because you're so busy with yours. You're so busy with your stuff. You're so consumed. And we ask God, God, would you help me, heal me, bless me, fix me, change me? And, and he does. He cares about all that. But he's going, son, he's going, daughter, I want to help you, heal you, bless you, fix you, change you. But I want you to see beyond you. I want you. In fact, some of your healing is directly tied to your ability to go beyond self, to actually care about this world, to actually care about the people who are far from him, who he so desperately loves. He wants you to love them like he loves them. He wants you to sacrifice like he sacrificed. He wants you to see them like he sees them. And so often Christians are so about self that it becomes the great barrier between the movement of God in any place. Most of us are familiar with the story of the Titanic, right? This great ship many years ago, it had 2,240 people on board. It hit an iceberg. There were 18 lifeboats that were deployed to save those who were on the ship. And the first lifeboat had 65 seats, but it left the scene with 12 people in it. The second lifeboat left half full as well. 
the third lifeboat, the fourth lifeboat, one after another after another, they left not filling the seats that they had. Only one of the 18 lifeboats went back for drowning people. This is real. The rest of them listened to the screams of fellow human beings and did nothing. Eva Hart was one of the survivors. She wrote this afterwards. She said, the sounds of people drowning are something that I cannot describe to you. Neither can anyone else. It's the most dreadful sound. And there is a terrible silence that follows it. Jack Thayer was another survivor. He said, the partly filled lifeboat standing by about 100 yards away never came back. Why on earth they never came back is a mystery. How could any human being fail to heed those cries? <laughs> you know why they didn't come back? We all know. Because they were thinking about themselves. That's why. What if too many people try to get into our boat and it sinks? What if their freezing bodies get me wet and I die of hypothermia? What if I risk my own comfort for the sake of their salvation? I'd rather just float away and cover my ears. Friends, what I'm saying to you is that I don't want to be a part of a church that floats away and covers our ears. I want to be a part of a church that goes back even at our own expense. And when we talk about open doors, I really believe that that's the biggest thing, that we just care about other things more. And so my prayer is that God would open our eyes. You know, some of us are really good at finding business opportunities. You see options in the market, this, and you go after them, and successful. Others of us are really good at seeing relationship opportunities. You connect people, you're a networker. But how many of us have developed the skill of seeing eternal opportunities? Because I want to tell you today that for whatever reason, in God's sovereign, gracious, kind plan, he has positioned this place, this church, this time, and we are standing in front of an open door. But it's going to take a mindset from God's people some of us, he's going to call to stay in Ephesus. Some of us, he's going to require that we adjust our plans. And my question for you today in part one of Open Doors is, will you say yes? I just invite you to stand with me. I want to pray for us. And I want to pray that right now, God's Holy Spirit would enable us to see beyond ourselves. I, I know that you might be here and you've got real things going on in your life. The Lord cares about those. I do not take those lightly. He, he sees you. He loves you. He cares about every detail in your life. But at the same time that he cares about the details of your life, he's also calling you to begin to see beyond yourself. The part of your healing can only come when you begin to love others as he does. And so I just want you to, right now, close your eyes and just ask the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing a song in a second here. Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you, would you help me see beyond me? And God, would you even bring my heart to a place where I am willing and ready to be interrupted? Lord, if you need to adjust my plans, I want to say yes to that. God, just as the Apostle John saw a door standing open. I pray that you would give me a love for people and a love for your church that would change the way I see the world. I open my heart to you, God. Let's take a moment and sing and let's speak that prayer back to God in our hearts.